So welcome to another episode of The Diplomat. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Today, joined by a very young and interesting man. He said that I'm going to say that it's in the contract. He says, no, Stephen, I'm not going to come on the show unless you say that. I says, no, it's fine, Gare. I will, I will absolutely say that for you, my friend. So Gare Tellefsen, the, uh, consul, uh, the honorary consul of Sweden and Norway. Gare, thank you for joining us. Thank you for coming in today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Very good to be here. So uh, we know about a consul general. Right, um, or general consul as you call it. What is an honorary consul? So an honorary consul is for those uh, destination that doesn't really, that isn't really big enough to have a full professional role for each country. So uh, the two countries I represent, Norway and Sweden, is small countries. Uh, Norway, five million people. Sweden, nine million people. Oh wow! So that is the small. size of Cape Town. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. So so we can't have a professional representation everywhere. Thought we are the most busy honorary consul in the world for Norway because there are lots of Norwegian tourists in Cape Town. Okay, so Ger, tell us about the coronavirus has been happening at the moment. Um, you've got a double role of Sweden and Norway and repatriating people back to, back to those countries. How has it been for you? No, so it's been busy uh, since the lockdown started and uh, you know we were warned about two weeks before. We started to warn everyone that they had to get home. We had to fill up the plane and uh, before the lockdowns, the, it was a strange period because the, in the start, the planes were not full. Then suddenly it filled up and we got as many as possible back home. But sure. we were still with about 250. That was on the first list that we repatriated over two weeks. And uh, now there are still somewhere between 100 and 200 left that would like to leave. Uh, but there are a few flights now. So tell me, um, these are tourists, right? There's not people that live in Cape Town that you say, okay, sorry, you gotta go home, cheers. There's, these are tourists, right? These are tourists. Okay. <laughs> yes. We're not sending people back. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay. But we do have a quite a lot of like what we call swallows here. So they have the South African summer and uh, Scandinavian winter. So we had a few of those that had arrived early okay. that no wanted to leave oh, so back here. Six months, six yeah, months, or yeah. okay. So, yeah. Okay. So tell us about your role here in, uh, in Cape Town in South Africa as an honorary consul for Sweden and Norway. Um, do you have anybody that supports you? What, what services, what functions do you do? What is, your, what is a day in the life of Ger? Yeah, no, so I'm, or, uh, my first role is that I'm a businessman here in, uh, in Cape Town. So I run a couple of businesses. Then I'm honorary consul for Norway and Sweden on the side. Um, I have a full-time uh, consular secretary, so she will do the brunt of our emergency work and we do a little bit of uh, visa work and passport work when it comes to adoption for instance with quite a lot of uh, Norwegian and Swedes that adopt uh, children from South Africa. Um, the normal visa work is outsourced so that is you do at uh, something called VFS yes. and is handled by Pretoria or embassy yes. and then I would report back to Pretoria but my primarily function uh, is to trade uh, trade representation and emergency. So of course we have lots of tourists and then there are also some emergencies. And the relationship between Norway, Sweden and Cape Town, South Africa, how is, how is that? It is very good. So, so both Norway and Sweden was big supporters under the struggle. So which meant that the, the new government after 94 has been uh, closely connected to both Norway and Sweden. So, so we have a very good response when we need diplomatic work done here in South Africa. Okay. Okay, so I know, to be honest, uh, know a little bit about Norway and Sweden, but uh, tell us about Norway first. It's, uh, well, both governments, you say, are royal families, right? That's right, So yes. let's start off with Norway. Um, they've got a royal family. Who is that? And do you have a president? Do you have a prime minister? How, how does it work? Yeah, so uh, country, the two countries are similar. Uh, you're all forming part of Scandinavia. Uh, We've been uh, siblings for a long time. Norway have been under Sweden more than once. Um, okay. And uh, we have a similar democratic model. We are seen as the most democratic countries in the world. Wow. Uh, competing uh, between number one and two often, Norway oh. and Sweden. Uh, have a royal family that has more like a kind of official status. Uh, both countries run by a prime minister through uh, four years elections. Uh, parliament choose the prime minister. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I think also when you look at all different uh, surveys of the happiness index, the, uh, the highest lifestyle index, Norway and Sweden will normally always be among the top five. Oh, wow. So it's, uh, it's small countries, uh, relatively uncomplicated to run, very efficient run. Wow, okay. So the royal family, 
basically they don't run the country, it's run by a prime minister. Absolutely. Or they have oversight. Yeah, well, uh, hardly. They are, uh, they are more of a representative role. Okay. Like a f not a figurehead, but like kind of, kind of ceremonial in a way. Yeah, yeah. And they have the, the official last say when, uh, when we uh, sign in our prime minister. Oh, is he it? will come to the king and the king will accept and sign. Oh, it's the same as the UK. That's right. So when they, they go, the prime minister goes to the queen and the queen either says yes or no. That's they right. They hardly ever say no. They say no. So yeah, no. they always say yes. yes. So, okay. So um, what, is, what is Norway and Sweden famous for? If, I, if, so I, if it's somebody uh, wanted to go to there, what would they, what they, what, what would they be seeing? Yeah, as a tourist, they're both uh, you know, beautiful from a nature point of view. It's uh, Norway, most famous for the fjords. Uh, very steep fjords, you know, where the word fjord comes from is Norwegian. Uh, heavy winters and uh, lately our northern lights has kind of been discovered all over the world. So oh. we didn't used to have much uh, winter tourism, uh, but now we have a, a massive amount of winter tourism, particularly cool. from Asia, uh, where we have 24 hour dark and really? uh, only the northern lights that comes up from time to time over the sky. 24 hour dark? Yeah. Really? In the north of Norway you don't have sunlight during winter. For how long is that? How many months? For about four months. Gosh, that is something hectic. I've yeah, but then on the off. summer you don't have uh, darkness. Really? So it's light all the time? Lights all the time. Have you loved in that environment? Yeah, is well I come uh, further south uh, and then we only have, uh, in summertime we have about uh, 17 hours sunlight. Sure. So, but I, of course I've been visited in the north and it's, it's very special. Both the dark, uh, dark end and the light, it's uh, very different. Is that must be confusing, right? Because I mean, you wake up in the dark, you go to sleep in the dark, mm. or you wake up in the sun and you go to sleep in the sun. Is it difficult to sleep? It must be difficult to sleep at daylight, eh? Yeah, well, some, you know, you don't sleep much. Really? So okay. you so sleep you more party a lot, you sleep eh? in the winter time. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> or when you get tired, you just go to the other side where it's dark. Uh, You're uh, like, exactly. okay, I need some sleep. Yeah. <laughs> and um, okay, so tell us about, so you were born in Norway? That's right. Uh, what part of Norway? So in the south. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, and uh, you asked also about the uh, Norway and Sweden side. So the, the Norwegian side for tourists, you go there for nature, you go for hiking, uh, you go for a very long coastline. Uh, then on the Sweden side, it's the, the definition of uh, going a walk in the woods. It's like incredible nature if you like trees and you like the, the real wood. Wow. Uh, beautiful old cities, uh, Stockholm and Göteborg, and also an amazing kind of coastline. So. It's uh, both Norway and Sweden, they say that it's like the, the undiscovered Mediterranean because it's an incredible coastline, but uh, the season is quite limited. So mm. our summer season is only really three months. Three months, okay. And what are what's Norway and Sweden in terms of food, um, dining, what are you guys famous for? So, uh, so it used to be that uh, the, both Norwegian and Swedish kitchen was quite simple because both countries was relatively poor in, uh, in a global context. Mm. But over the last 50 years, the, the wealth has increased dramatically in the north. And uh, what you see is that you have uh, lots of kind of uh, fresh ingredients there on the berries, on the game, oh, wow. uh, the different vegetables, and then the uh, seafood, of course. Oh, really? So, okay. and lots of modern cuisine is coming out from Norway and Sweden, and they have uh, won the world championship quite a few times. So, sure. so they, the good restaurants are doing well. So you, you've been here in, in Cape Town, South Africa for 17 years. That's right, say. yes. Okay, and before that you said that Norway and Sweden played a big role also in supporting South Africa in the time of apartheid. Tell us mm. more about that. Yeah, and also they were both, uh, well not even, and both undercover and, uh, and official supporter of uh, ANC during the struggle. And uh, did not have open embassies in South Africa, only representation. Uh, but uh, supporting both on funds and uh, and receiving uh, ANC uh, representatives in the countries. Like Sir Ramaphosa has his union training from Sweden. Oh wow. So he spent a lot of time in Sweden. Wow. And before you come to South Africa, before you came to, South, uh, to Cape Town, what were your, your views and experiences? What had you heard about South Africa? And then coming here, were you like, oh, that's kind of different? Yeah, sure. I think I had the same experience as everyone else. You, uh, you expect to come to Africa and it's not the Africa you expect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then, you know, Africa is a lot. Yes. And I think, you know, Cape Town is probably like on the one side and then there's a, a big span of what we can experience in Africa. So That's I find right. it a fascinating continent. And uh, what do you love about Cape Town? 
Well, I think uh, Cape Town is, you feel alive every day. Uh, you, it's not like one type of people in Cape Town, it's all type of people. It's, uh, you meet kind of the whole world in the one day. Uh, okay, we're going to take cosmopolitan. a break. We'll, we'll talk mm. more about that in a moment. Uh, you are with The Diplomat. Uh, thank you for being a part of the show. If you want to interact, at Stephen Taylor SA is where you can find me on social media. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back to The Diplomat. We are in conversation with the honorary consul of Norway and Sweden, Geir Tellefsen. Um, Gay, you still here? You still okay? You still Absolutely. Enjoying yourself? You still alright? <laughs> totally. <laughs> so we're talking about Cape Town. What you love about Cape Town? Um, obviously, been here in South Africa 17 years. Has, has all that time been in Cape Town, or did you live in other parts of South Africa? All the time in Cape Town. Really? Yes. Wow. I do uh, have had a farm up in Robertson, which is close by Cape Town. Yes. So we spent uh, a few years in uh, Robertson. Okay. Yeah. Farming what? We are farming wine. Oh, yes. Okay. So you like your wine? Absolutely. South Africa is very popular for wine, eh? Absolutely. What, do you have any favorites? Yeah, yeah, I do. Okay, uh. okay we won't say that here. <laughs> Maybe somebody's watching. <laughs> okay, no, wine is good. Um, all right. Uh, so, uh, in terms of music in Norway and Sweden, what kind of music do they have there? Is it normal, like we'd hear here, or do you have your own kind of music as well? Well, we also we have the traditional music, which is more folk music, uh, which uh, I think like in every country, not that many people listen to it anymore. <laughs> yeah. So it's more for special interests. Uh, we have a big uh, classical scene, uh, but we also have uh, modern uh, music, like uh, Kigo, for instance, coming from... Oh, uh, yes, Kigo, okay. Yeah. Is it, you said Kigo. Yeah, in we Norwegian, Kigo. Kigo. Okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Actually, a neighbor of a good friend of mine. Yeah, so it's... Uh, so we have also, you know, new artists coming in, and it's a vibrant music uh, scene. In uh, well for himself. Himself. He's actually collaborated with a lot of artists. He's doing, yeah, he's doing really big things. Yeah. Um, and in terms of sports, uh, you don't really watch a lot of sports, but that's okay because you're a businessman. <laughs> you're busy. Um, and in terms of business, what business do you do? Are you like, can you talk about that? Yeah. So, so I, I do, you know, different businesses here in South Africa, but in, within uh, food and wine, and okay. also in technology. Okay. Uh, but Norway and Sweden uh, are doing quite a bit of business in South Africa. So Norway is a petrol nation. We are big on oil uh, exploration and uh, leading on offshore oil uh, exploration. Oh, wow. And uh, the field that was just discovered in uh, Mossel Bay was done by Total, but uh, all crew and ship from Norway. I uh, didn't hear about that. What is that? Mossel Bay? What happened? Oh, yeah. So it's a new gas find in uh, South Africa half a year ago. Oh, wow. So, so we do believe in, you know, a, a kind of gas generation coming into South Africa. And uh, yeah, a lot of that had covered by Norwegians. Okay. Uh, and the other thing is, of course, uh, our famous uh, Norwegian salmon that we sell a lot of in yes. South Africa and through Africa. Yes, that um, is big. Mm. Yeah. And in, uh, in countries like uh, Nigeria, we export a lot of uh, dried fish, like massive amount of uh, dried cod that really? goes to Nigeria. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so while Sweden is more industrial, there are, you know, your Volvo cars, uh, oh Saab, yes. uh, Ericsson, um, cell phone technology, it's, uh, they are more industrial and also exporting all over Africa. Sure. So uh, some of the projects that you're involved here as honorary consul, is it the same as a consul general or not really the same? You don't really do activities and projects per se? Uh, was some that more done by the embassy? Yeah, uh, so we, since I'm not professional doing this full yes. time, then uh, we limit what I do, okay. uh, but uh, overall, a lot of what needs to be delivered uh, will be delivered. So we just scale down uh, okay. according to our size of the countries as well. And then the, the embassy has more of the roles uh, than a general consul could do. Okay. And um, who is the ambassador for Norway and Sweden here? Yeah, so it's... Uh, Austri, uh, the Norwegian ambassador, and Cecilia, the Swedish ambassador, both female, and we have had uh, female ambassadors for the last uh, few years. Oh, wow. Very common in Norway. So uh, Norway and Sweden is the kind of the most integrated society when it uh, comes to no difference between a man and woman. So uh, yeah, you see that through the, the uh, diplomatic as well. That's amazing. And the prime minister is uh, male or female? Uh, female. Oh wow, <laughs> yes. that's hectic. So something that the world is been through in the last couple of months, um, a turning point for all of us and something that uh, not, none of us have been through is the coronavirus, mm. COVID-19. 
I mean, if we think back a few years ago, there was the swine flu. Um, I actually got swine flu that time and I was in the hospital for a week um, and luckily survived that. But uh, now with this, obviously that time they had a, a vaccine that was able to be treated. With COVID-19, it's something completely different. So Norway and Sweden, you said that they handling it differently. Mm. Tell us about that. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, so that, it's very interesting. And I think it's going to be a lot of research on the, the what happened in Norway, Sweden, and also Denmark, because they handle it differently. And their nations are very much the same. They are same kind of people. Uh, they do the same. They all have a natural social distancing out of their culture. So a lot of people living alone in their properties. Uh, families are small, uh, very seldom that you have intergenerational living, like uh, different from Italy or South Africa. Yeah. So all on one uh, separate property. Uh, but in Sweden, they didn't have a lockdown. So schools and business has been open throughout the COVID-19 crisis. Sure. While in uh, Norway, we had a pretty hard lockdown. Uh, Similar it, to South Africa. Yeah, well, not as strong as here, but uh, but still strong. School closed and uh, okay. yeah, and people working from home. Um, and there has been higher debt tolls in Sweden, uh, clearly, but still not higher uh, than well, lower than uh, type of England, uh, France, mm. Italy, Spain, uh, even without a lockdown. And that is. Uh, it's interesting for similar uh, for a couple of reasons, and one is that I told you earlier that yeah. uh, the winter holiday in uh, in Scandinavia was really bad. It was not much snow, so everyone opted to go to the to ski in the Alps, which was the epicenter of COVID nineteen. So there was a lot of people coming home with COVID nineteen, both in Sweden and Norway at the same time, and then they handled it differently, and it will be a different outcome, which I don't think we will know the result of before, like in a year or two. Yes. So that is an interesting approach. So obviously, if you get the virus, like I got swine flu that time, your body builds up antibodies mm. and immune, your, your body uh, builds up an immune, how do you say it? Um, yeah, antibodies, right? Yeah, antibodies, yeah. So um, your body fights that in a way and uh, tries to protect itself. So Sweden is of the view that if everyone gets COVID-19, that uh, maybe well, the recovery rate is quite high. Yeah, the, so I, I think what the Sweden is saying is that as long as the healthcare can deliver, so we don't want the health code to be overwhelmed. Yes. So they sized up the healthcare, and it has never been overwhelmed in Sweden. And uh, and they think that the Stockholm has now more than thirty percent uh, of the uh, people living in Stockholm has had COVID. Yeah. Uh, the big problem in Sweden was, like in many other countries, is that it got into the, the wards of the elderly. And there we have uh, big losses. But uh, otherwise, I think WHO and many others means that this, or kind of say that the Swedish model seems to be the most successful one. So, but I think you know, history will tell. Uh, yeah. In Norway, the lockdown was very successful uh, from a health point of view, but there there are complaints because it's only about two and a half percent of Norwegians that has got infected with COVID. Sure. So, so there is a question whether this will be a, a second run. Yeah. So that's an interesting approach to having a, a lockdown, mm. to having a no lockdown and continuing with life. And um, I don't know, I, uh, in a way, I kind of think Sweden's, um, they're gutsy. It's, a, it's, it's an interesting approach. And um, I think it's, let's see in a year or two maybe mm. it was the right approach mm. we don't know because uh yeah it's it's it is we there is no right and wrong right but well i think only history will show that's right yeah so wow hectic times we're living in really hectic times have you been through anything like this before um in your no lifetime? no not really this has been uh, new for me and for many others i think is it how has it changed your life has it changed your life in a way no, so I work from home, I think, from like uh, most people today, yes. the office is closed. Uh, oh, so you have an office? Oh, yes, yes. And uh, one of my businesses, the wine business, is closed. Uh, my food business is uh, doing better than ever. Wow. And, uh, you know, so it's a bit up and down, ups and downs. And Did uh, they open the wine exports again? No. Uh, uh, export you can do, yeah, but oh. not uh, actually production of it. Oh, wow. Uh, but we actually are domestic uh, producer here. Okay. But yeah, so, th so things are different. But I think, you know, uh, for myself, we're very lucky to live in a comfortable home. It's, uh, you know, there's a lot of people in South Africa that are really struggling today. Yeah, they are. 
yeah, we think of them at this time. It's, uh, it, is, it is hectic, um, not only in South Africa, but around the world, how this has affected so many countries, so many economies, so many people in, in, in different ways. It is actually, uh, it's sad in a way, because, um, yeah, I have no words. It's just, uh, wow, uh, that's another fight for another day, right? Absolutely. Um, so, 17 years in South Africa, um, is there, and you've been consul, honorary consul for three years. That's right. Is there a time period, or how does it work? Um, it is uh, five years at a time. Okay. But, uh, yeah, my, my predecessor, he was uh, honorary consul for 25 years, so <laughs> we will see. <laughs> how old is he now, 35? <laughs> <laughs> no. So he is now retired. Oh, shame, man. Yes. Um, okay, so honorary consul, uh, do you get uh, the diplomatic plate on your car? No, we don't. Not in South Africa. It's a really? bit different from country to country, how they handle uh, Okay. Uh, honorary consulates. And the logo that goes on your house, you can put that on? I do that, yeah. Okay. yeah. And you've got a, not a diplomatic passport, but you've got a diplomatic ID. Uh, that's right. Which yes. gives you immunity uh, in South Africa. Yeah. So, wow. And, uh, you know, and that can be necessary. You know, I, I think COVID was a good example of that because then you, as a diplomatic, I was allowed to move around, okay. which is uh, necessary, you know, because suddenly we had crisis among yes. the people that we look after. So. Are you going to stay in South Africa? You, you've, you've, you, you live here now? You're a permanent resident? Yeah, yeah. We are permanent residents. I have my family, Norwegian wife, two kids that have uh, their whole childhood in South Africa. They Plus your wife came with you over. That's right, yes. Okay. And uh, so our children, they think they are Norwegian, but of course they are <laughs> South African. <laughs> oh yeah, what is the language? The language of Sweden and Norway is, is it different or is it the same? They are, it is different, but we can speak to each other. Okay. So it's like a, uh, like a dialect. So if I had to say hello in Norway, how would I say that? They say hi. Hi. Yes. And Sweden? Hey. Oh, wow. So <laughs> quite the same. Because <laughs> here in South Africa, sometimes when you say hey to somebody, they think you're being rude. That's you're right. Like, hey. <laughs> like, no, but I'm just saying hi. Come on, I'm, 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 sw I'm speaking Swedish. <laughs> and so, okay, so I want to hear how the language sounds. So give us um, like a sentence like, uh, hi, my name is, and I'm in Cape Town. So yeah, hi. So, I have a gear, or I am in Cape Town, which is Norwegian. And in Swedish, it would be, hey, I have a gear, or I am in Cape Town. Oh, wow. So, it's uh, quite similar. That's wow. That's hectic. Is it a difficult language to learn, both of them? It's reasonably difficult, but uh, it's, uh, if you speak Afrikaans, then it's uh, lots of similarities. Oh, so similar to Dutch? Yes. Kind of. So, okay. it's a Dutch, uh, Germanic language. So, is how many there's you've got the Norway and Sweden? Do you speak a lot of English in Norway and Sweden? Yes, we do. So oh, yeah. everybody speaks English. Really? Yeah. So that you <coughs> you never speak English to each other, but everybody is fluent in English. That's amazing. Oh, so you taught in school? Yes, oh, from wow. very early age, and we also we don't do uh, we only do subtitle on TV, so all English program are in English. Oh, so wow. I kind of have done something with the nation. I'm not going to put subtitles on today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Gear, for joining us. It's been amazing. Um, I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you for taking the time out to come and join us. And uh, yeah, please come again. You're welcome anytime. Fabulous. Um, thank you. Thank you. Another episode of The Diplomat. Uh, please get in touch at Stephen Taylor Essays, where you can find me on social media. Thank you to Gear, uh, Honorary Consul of Norway and Sweden. We'll see you next time, same time, same place. God bless. Bye bye. <laughs>